Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The Emotional Effects of Living with a Chronic Rare Disease. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You have joined the presentation, Listening Using Your Computer Speaker System by default. If you would prefer to join over the telephone, just select Telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded. I would now like to pass the presentation over to Deb Fowler, who will introduce today's speaker. Over to you, Deb. Thanks, Clara. Thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. We're really excited to be hosting this webinar. It's one of the first webinars we've done on this very important topic about the emotional effects of living with HPP or chronic disease. And we're really excited to bring this uh, platform to you as it's something that we know is important. We've heard from you several times in terms of the, the importance of having this topic covered, and we're excited to actually have a member of our community here to talk about it with us. Um, sorry, I'm trying to change my slide, and I, I don't look like I have control here. So, oh, there it is, I see it. There we go. Um, so for those of you who are new to the SoftBones community, I thought I would just take a couple moments to discuss our organization, what we do, how we're structured, and how we support the patient community. Um, here's a couple pictures from our patient meetings. Many of you know about our patient meetings. We have two coming up this year um, to celebrate our 10-year anniversary as a patient advocacy organization for HPP. Um, one in La Jolla, California in July, and another one coming up in New Jersey in October. And these meetings are amazing. They're a chance for us to connect with each other, to be able to um, bring some of our discussions that we have in Facebook alive, meet other patients who are on similar journeys and similar paths, and the, the emotional connection is just always so important. But, you know, that being said, um, next slide, we're, we're much more than a patient meeting and a Facebook page. So we have an important mission, and we provide valuable information, education, and support for people living with HPP, their families and caregivers, and we also have an important arm of our um, organization that promotes research. We have uh, uh, grants that we actually provide to researchers. We have a scientific advisory board, and we're constantly um, going back to that advisory board to make sure that we have accurate information to communicate to patients about the condition. There's so much we don't know about HPP, and while we are still advocating for more research, you know, we always want to make sure that the information that we're providing has scientific basis, and it's important that we when we share information about our journeys that we know what's really fact and what's advice coming from other patients. So we try, to, we try to be very clear about giving you information that's really gonna help you to manage your condition working with your own doctor. Next slide. So as you may be aware, we've recently regionalized. We have eight regions across the country and if you find your state and color code it with the legend down below, you can see where some of those um, regions are, and we can put you in contact with your region lead. Um, if you're not familiar with who your region lead is, please reach out to um, Denise and ask her to put you in contact with your region lead. Um, there's lots of exciting things happening with local meetings. We had two this past weekend that were really well attended, and we have one coming up in Ohio that's um, really exciting in June. So lots to uh, be on the lookout for and lots of ways to communicate right in our own areas where we live. Next slide. And the other way that we really provide some support for researchers is by providing a window into accessing our patient community. And we do this in a way where patients' identities and privacy are protected through a patient registry. We have partnered with the um, Stanford CORDS, which is the Coordination of Rare Disease at Stanford, and we have developed what we call a contact registry, which is basically some very foundational information on HPP um, for carriers and for people who actually have disease. And this provides researchers with a way to take some of their research hypotheses and test them within certain patient audiences. 
there's not a clear understanding about the differentiation of symptoms and, and disease of a carrier versus somebody who carries two mutations. So we're really trying to better understand that. We have a lot of um, researchers who are now reaching out to us and they will use our, our registry as a way to reach out to the patients. So if you have not already put your information into the registry, I would ask you to please, please make sure you do that. It is how we show our voice, our strength in numbers, and how the best way that patients who, whether they're on Facebook or maybe they are um, not even members of the soft bones community, they can still be contacted by researchers and opt in to share their information with them. It's all completely in your control. You own your data and nobody has access to you unless you give them permission. So it's, it's a great way to be able to uh, come together and show our strength as a community by having as many patients as possible entered into the registry. Next slide. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, Adriana Twami is a licensed clinical social worker in the state of Connecticut. She received her bachelor's degree from Providence College, and she went on to get her master's in social work from Simmons College. She's been working in the field of clinical social work for 13 years. At the current time, she's a regional director of school-based behavioral health studies in New Britain, Connecticut. She works in a school-based health clinic in a high school and also has a private practice where she services both teenagers and adults. She treats patients who live with depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder, among many others. She also helps people advocate for themselves and is a firm believer in self-care and the power of positive thinking. She has experience working with patients who have chronic diseases and has personal experience as well as her son Ryan was diagnosed with hypophosphatasia at a year old. He's currently six years old. And Adriana lives in Connecticut with her husband, Michael, and her other son, she has two boys, Ryan, who's six, and Johnny, who's two. So Adriana, thank you for joining us tonight. I'm really excited about this webinar. Thank you, Deb, me as well. Um, um, can you guys hear so me okay? Yeah, we thought we would kick things off by um, doing the poll. So we wanted to just throw a question out there to all of you. Um, just when you're looking for mental health support and you're trying to find um, any kind of uh, emotional support, where do you and your family seek that support? Is it online, through family and friends, through a professional therapist, through a support group? Or do you really just not really do anything? So we'll give everybody a few minutes to vote. I think it's a great question because, you know, for us, it'll help us to see where patients are, are going for support and how we can continue to fill in some of the gaps if maybe they're going somewhere that we don't currently, you know, know that they're going and we can make sure that they have support in all those areas. Absolutely. And I think mental health, there's such a stigma attached to it. So to kind of open that up and, and really talk about where we can get help um, and who we can reach out to is really, really important. Absolutely. So here are the results. Adriana, I'm going to let you take it from here. Absolutely. So 44% online, 61% family and friends, 28 um, through a professional therapist, support group 50, and nothing 11. So um, definitely this is not surprising. I think a lot of people do reach out to their family and friends for support, which is awesome. And I think that's a great um, network to have. And I will get into that, you know, as, as I do my presentation. Um, support groups are great. Um, you know, soft bones just in and of itself online has been wonderful. Um, professional therapists, um, you know, I'm, I'm certainly, you know, in favor of that because of my, my job. Um, online grade Google, right, and looking for different things on there is really helpful. Um, and to see that the 11% do nothing, I'm hoping that after this presentation, maybe that will change a little bit. So you guys have, um, you can find more resources to help you um, get through some of the emotional effects that come along with living with um, specifically hypophosphatasia, but any rare disease, you know, in general. Um, okay, awesome. So can I just click out of this? Let's see. Perfect. 
Okay, so thank you, Deb, for that introduction. And I am going to start now um, with the presentation of the emotional effects of living with a chronic rare disease. So just a brief overview of kind of what I'm going to be talking about tonight. So with any chronic rare disease, you know, and specifically to hypophosphatasia, um, there are a lot of secondary diagnoses that can come along with um, being diagnosed with a rare disease. Um, you know, there's anxiety, there's depression, there's significant medical trauma, you know, that comes along with that. And so I want to talk to you all about what these are, what these three specific things are, and how to recognize them, the signs and symptoms, um, different coping strategies, and how and who to reach out to for help. So who can we go to, you know, when we're feeling this way, um, what resources there are that are out there. Um, another really important part of this presentation is going to be the role of caregivers. So as a caregiver, you know, we are caring for these people that we love and it's really hard to watch sometimes and it's really hard to be put into that role. And it's okay to say that and it's okay to admit that it can be really challenging. So we're going to talk about the role of caregivers and um, the secondary trauma that can actually come about with being a caregiver as well as burnout and how to recognize burnout and how to learn self-care. Um, and at the end of my presentation, um, I will be talking really specifically about different coping skills that we can use, whether you are a patient diagnosed with hypophosphatasia or you are a caregiver, because a lot of them are very similar and different things that you can do to help yourself feel better and just make things maybe a little bit easier. So I want to talk a little bit to begin about the process of being diagnosed with a rare disease. So definitely when, you know, we get that call from the doctor or when we are in the process of being diagnosed, there's a lot of um, feelings that come up with this, right? So there can be a lot of anger, right? A lot of sadness, a lot of anxiety, waiting for that doctor's phone call, waiting for that genetic test result. It can be really, really, um, challenging to say the least. Um, I think as a parent, there can be intense feelings of guilt, um, as if you're responsible for, you know, passing this on to your child or passing this on to a loved one in your family because you also have it. Um, so I think there's a lot of guilt that comes along with um, the process of being diagnosed as a parent. Um, there can be shame, feelings of isolation and hopelessness, um, especially with hypophosphatasia, because it is so rare, um, you know, it can be very isolating, right? You know, I have this disease that nobody else has, nobody understands me, nobody can really kind of relate to what I am feeling. So that in and of itself is very, very isolating. Um, so we're gonna talk about that, you know, as we go through, um, you know, the next half hour. Um, feeling like there's no one to talk to or anyone who will understand, that can really, make us feel like we're kind of on an island by ourselves, right? And it can really make us feel that, you know, we're kind of totally alone, which can be really, really um, depressing and it can cause that anxiety, you know, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, there is a true grieving process, you know, when someone is diagnosed with um, a rare disease and hypophosphatasia. And part of that is kind of thinking about what life was like before diagnosis versus what life is like now after diagnosis. Um, we think about the things we have to change. We think about the energy we might not have. We think about, you know, things we can't do. Um, we can get really, really stuck in a place where it can feel pretty miserable. And, you know, certainly this is not everybody's experience, but it, it, it is the experience of some. So there, there is a grieving process. And as a parent, you know, we also go through a grieving process and that's okay. You know, we have a child who we love and is wonderful and, you know, we want them to live a certain life and then boom, you know, they're diagnosed with this medical issue that we realize could really significantly alter their life. And as a parent, that's okay to be upset about that. It's okay to be angry and be upset. And I think that's something that a lot of parents who have children with either hypophosphatasia or other rare diseases really, really 
um, can experience. So it's, it's okay to feel like that. Um, so as we kind of go through the next slides, I want to talk to you about three different specific secondary diagnoses. So we have depression, which is one um, diagnosis that a lot of people with rare diseases are diagnosed with depression. Um, they're also diagnosed with anxiety or medical trauma. So certainly, you know, as I'm going through the next part of the presentation, you might kind of be like, oh my gosh, I feel like that, or that's something I experience. And kind of keep that in mind a little bit. It doesn't mean you necessarily have these diagnoses because there's a certain criteria. You have to meet five out of seven of them over a certain period of time. Um, but I think just the elements of each diagnosis are something that we all feel at some point in this process. So we'll, we'll start with Okay, so we'll start with depression here. So some of the main components or symptoms of depression, so sleep issues. So a lot of people, you know, they either can't fall asleep at night or they're not sleeping enough or sleeping too much or falling asleep and then waking up several times throughout the night and it's just really disruptive sleep. So that is certainly a main symptom of um depression, so increased in agitation. A lot of teenagers and younger children, um, rather than moping around and being sad, they actually are agitated. And it's the agitated, angry kids that it's an actual underlying depression rather than anger that's driving um, that agitation. We can have withdrawal from social activities and, I, and we isolate ourselves. So, you know, we're diagnosed with this rare disease, we feel different from people, we're just not feeling ourselves. We don't want to explain ourselves to people. We don't want to, you know, people to be like, why are you so tired? Why are you always in pain? You know, so we just kind of remove ourselves from social situations. Um, weight loss can be a symptom as well as weight gain. So eating too much or too little. Um, irritability, crying. Um, a lot of times we can have difficulty forming relationships with people. Um, we either attach too quickly or we can't attach to people at all because we're not sure how to. Um, we might have a difficult time expressing our emotions. Um, we can become very reactive to situations, right? So we're upset about something and then one small thing happens and we explode, right? So we might just have these over-exaggerated reactions to situations. Um, back to that feelings of guilt, right? Um, Self-destructive behaviors, um, decrease in attention and memory, and physical pain. So I'm gonna focus um, specifically on physical pain, because I think with pain, um, I want to go a little bit more in depth, because pain can come from two sources. So there's a medical component to pain and an emotional component. So pain is a symptom of hypophosphatasia, as we know, right? Many people with HPP live with daily chronic pain. So there's that part of it. But then if you're living with a chronic disorder, you also can become depressed and you can get pain symptoms from depression. So it's coming at people from two different sources, which is why I want to focus on it a little bit tonight. Um, so when someone is experiencing pain, you develop an anxiety about it, right? When am I going to feel pain again? When am I going to feel better? You might have a day where you feel really, really good and active, and then you're worried about the pain it's going to be cause you the next day. So there's a lot of anxiety around that. Um, a lot of times we find that pain can control our life and it becomes a focus for us, right? And we become hyper vigilant to it. Um, research shows that the more you focus on something, the more you notice it, right? So if you have a headache or your back hurts or you're achy, the more you sit and focus on that one thing and become really mindful about it, the more you're going to experience that pain. So, um, that's something to kind of keep in mind as, as we go through this. Um, we can certainly have behavioral changes when it comes to pain, right? We don't go for walks anymore. We don't want to go outside. We don't want to participate in things we used to participate in because it's painful, right? It's really, really hurtful. Um, one thing to also mention about pain is that doctors can't see pain. So when we go to the doctors and we are explaining our symptoms, 
to them and describe our symptoms as feeling pain, sometimes we feel unheard, right, or misheard or misunderstood because that doctor really can't see pain. So a lot of times pain can be very, very isolating. In pain specifically, there are um, a few very specific emotional responses to pain. One, an increase in anxiety. Two, increase in depression. Um, and three, an increase in anger. So if you have more pain, the person tends to feel more angry. Um, why me? Why do I have to go through this? Um, so pain is very, very, um, it's specific to HPP, and it's also just specific, um, it's, it's a great thing to talk about when talking about the emotional response to um, living with hypophosphatasia. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that when we are feeling anxious, we tend to what? Tighten our muscles, you know, clench our jaw, our heart rate goes up, our blood pressure goes up, so our body, you know, releases all of this adrenaline, which can then cause pain. So pain is just such an over, um, it just such a, it just kind of covers everything, you know, that, that we're talking about here. So uh, I wanted to speak a little bit more in depth about that. Um, if we go on to anxiety, so a lot of people that are diagnosed with a rare disorder also have an underlying anxiety or an anxiety that results from being diagnosed with a rare disorder. So anxiety, right? You have fear, you have uneasiness, there are sleep problems as similar to those with depression, um, weight loss. Typically anxiety is weight loss because we are unable to eat when we are feeling anxious. Um, we're not able to stay still. We're not able to stay calm typically when we are feeling anxious. Um, there are a lot of physical symptoms with anxiety. So we can feel cold, sweaty, numb. We can have tingling hands or feet, shortness of breath, heart palpitations, dry mouth, nausea. Um, a lot of people that go into full anxiety attacks or panic attacks feel that they're actually having a heart attack because it can feel like that tightness in your chest or like something really heavy sitting on your chest. Um, so these are some really um, intense symptoms that somebody can feel, you know, when, when experiencing that anxiety. Um, so I kind of put this picture up here because I think it's a great kind of, um, it, it really depicts anxiety very, very well. So, um, you know, I'm not going to read all of these on here, but you can certainly take a look. And just see, you know, restlessness, you know, sweating, stress, fear, chest pains. Um, there's a lot of different symptoms to anxiety that you might feel, right, as, as a result of, of having um, hypophosphatasia or a rare genetic disorder. So the third thing that I would like to talk about with um, as far as the psychological effects of living with um, hypophosphatasia is the medical trauma. So medical traumatic stress refers to um, the set of psychological and physiological responses to pain, injury, serious illness, medical procedures, and invasive or frightening treatment experiences. Um, it can, and it's really important to note too that medical trauma can result from either a single event or multiple medical events. So um, one thing to kind of keep in mind is, you know, those of us that have children, right? So these children go for um, you know, blood draws, they go for really um, pretty intensive surgeries, you know, they go for genetic testing. So they go for all of these things. And sometimes we assume, okay, they go for the testing, they're done, they're fine, but they themselves might be experiencing this medical trauma. So to kind of keep that in mind too, children that have medical trauma typically will present with post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. So that could be um, nightmares, fear, anxiety over going to the doctor, um, fear of appointments, um, feeling very anxious, not sleeping well at night, um, regressive symptoms. If you have a child who typically, you know, doesn't let the bed or is fully potty trained, they might go backwards um, and have some of that regression. Um, they could seem very irritable, which would be that depression piece. Right? We talked about you know, depression looking like irritability in younger children and teenagers. So just to keep that in mind, and, and certainly as adults, we can have that medical trauma too, right? Um, you know, any invasive or frightening treatments that we might have 
our experience to that can also result in medical trauma. We may have nightmares from it. We may feel um, really um, nervous about going to a doctor. We might feel really anxious. So just to kind of kind of keep this medical trauma um, in mind as well. So one thing, um, so this is just a, an overview of seeking help, and I will get into specific coping skills that people can do um, at the end of my presentation, but I think it's really important to recognize the symptoms and the emotional effects of being diagnosed with a rare disease and certainly finding a therapist local to you that works with patients who have a secondary medical diagnosis um, and working with a therapist who understands people who live with daily pain. That's very, very important. Um, in my practice, I advertise as such, so I do get a lot of patients who have chronic back pain, who have chronic pain, um, who have different medical diagnoses because, you know, you might work with that patient differently. Um, and to find a support group. I know one of the, the poll questions was, you know, finding a support group, and a lot of you did say that that was something you do. So connecting with others that have the same disease as you or the same medical issues. And I think that's where soft bones really comes into play and is really, really important because it kind of gives people a place to talk together as a whole and really understand each other. So finding a support group can be very, very crucial um, in seeking help. So I wanna to jump to the role of caregivers. So a caregiver, you know, as you know, is someone who is going to care for a loved one, a child, a family member, um, in this specific case, who, who is sick, right? Who might need, who might be more medically fragile, who might need more medical attention. Um, so the role of caregivers is very important to talk about because it can be very stressful and very, um, very rewarding at times also, but um, a lot of stressors. So we're gonna talk about caregiver burnout. So caregiver burnout is the state of emotional, mental, and physical exhaustion caused by the prolonged and overwhelming stress of caregiving. Um, so certainly, you know, caregiving can be very rewarding, like I said, but it's also, it can be really, really stressful. Um, so what do we do as caregivers of um, people with hypophosphatasia or people that, you know, we love that are living with a medical diagnosis? So as parents, as grandparents, um, as foster parents, you know, we take children and family members to doctor's appointments. We sit with them during procedures. We are in constant worry a lot of the time, right, about our loved ones and what's gonna happen and how things are. And we, a lot of times, caregivers can't work and there's a huge financial stress on um, a caregiver because they might not be able to work. They can't receive a salary that they used to receive. So it can be really, really stressful. Um, a lot of caregivers are making decisions for loved ones who might not be able to do so otherwise by themselves. So that in and of itself is very, very um, daunting or can be daunting. Um, caregivers also might be the ones to educate the doctors. So specifically to hypophosphatasia, many we are finding, you know, that many doctors don't really know what it is, and, and we are working really hard to educate doctors on this diagnosis so that they can treat patients, but a lot of parents are spending much of their time Googling and educating doctors on their own. So not only are they taking their children to these appointments, but they're also educating the person that is treating their child, and that can be very, very um stressful and overwhelming um, as a parent. So caregivers, give yourself some credit because you don't have, it's not always easy, it's really not always easy. Um, caregivers have a huge rate of burnout, right? So we are, when you are caring for somebody, right, there's a lot of things that can happen and a lot of things that you might recognize in yourself. And if you recognize any of these things on this slide, um, you might be getting a little bit burned out. So there can be withdrawal from family and friends of a caregiver. Um, you might have loss of interest in activities that you previously enjoyed, um, feeling blue, irritable, hopeless, and helpless um, as a caregiver. You might have changes in appetite, um, changes in sleep patterns, and also you might get sick more often. And 
But getting sick more often is when we are not taking care of ourselves, we are caring for someone else, and we're not eating properly, and we're not sleeping properly, our immune systems tank. They go down. So we might be getting sick more often. That's, that's certainly a result of all of that. Um, there is a secondary um, trauma that can also come about with um, caregivers, and I don't have a slide for this, but I do want to talk a little bit about it. Um, as caregivers, we can experience a secondary trauma. Secondary trauma is different from burnout. So burnout is that feeling of just feeling burnt out, right? We are exhausted. We are tired. Um, that's one side of it. The secondary trauma are, as a caregiver, a secondary trauma is the feelings and behaviors that result from indirect exposure to something traumatic. So as a caregiver, if we're seeing our loved one go through a surgery or go through different medical procedures, the secondary trauma is how we feel, how we are traumatized by that event that we see our loved one go through. So keep that in mind too. It's different than burnout, but it's also something really significant. And if you are feeling a secondary um, traumatic experience from caring from a loved one, to reach out to somebody um, and, and use some of the coping strategies and skills that I will be talking about shortly. Um, so some tips to avoid this burnout and secondary trauma. Caring for yourself, okay? So getting enough sleep. Um, that's really hard to do sometimes, and I certainly understand that, but making sure that you're sleeping enough, because if we don't get enough sleep, that increases our anxiety, it can increase our depression. Um, sleep is so, so crucial. Um, proper nutrition, you know, certain foods that we eat, such as sugar and gluten and different dietary things can actually increase depression. Um, the way that we metabolize food is directly related to our emotions. So sugar can, you know, give us that sugar crash. It can cause us to be hyper and then to have this really low mood. Um, and I will, we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, as a caregiver, make sure that you maintain your own interests and hobbies, right? I mean, if you're caring for this person often, it's really important to keep a role for yourself and to make sure that you keep a self-identity, um, which I know can be really, really hard. And you might be thinking, how am I supposed to do that? You know, I'm caring for so-and-so all the time. It is hard, but it's also really important to make sure that you keep, keep a hobby. Um, Spend time away from that person, you know, and, and it, you might feel guilty a little bit, but spend time away, right? Try to get away from your caregiving role, even if it's just 15 minutes a day. Um, really, really important to kind of keep your own um, mindfulness about you and to, to make sure that you are taking care of yourself so you can then take care of somebody else. Um, finding a community. So we have the soft bones community, which is wonderful. And, um, you know, certainly there's a lot of action on, on that webpage about, you know, caregivers and how we care for those, you know, children and, and people that have hypophosphatasia. So making sure that you find a community. Um, I'm a big advocate for um, professional therapy. I think it's really great to have someone other than a family member or friend to give you a um, certain perspective that you might not get from a family member um, who you can totally vent to. There's no emotional, like intimate attachment there. I think therapy is, is wonderful. Um, and make sure you give yourself credit. Being a caregiver is not easy and just let yourself know and, and do that positive self-talk that you're, you're in a really tough role, but you're also doing really well. And all days are not going to be perfect and that's okay. And it's okay to feel guilty and it's okay to feel um, you know, upset and angry, and that's okay. And let yourself feel that because if we stuff those emotions and we brush them to the side and say, I shouldn't feel that way, then guess what? They're coming up, you know, a month later and it's going to come out in, in some not so fun ways. So let yourself feel upset, angry, if that's, if that's how you feel. Um, I want to, the last part of my presentation is going to be about specific coping skills and things that we can do to make ourselves feel better, whether it's um, whether it pertains to being diagnosed with hypophosphatasia or being in a caregiver role. But before I get into those, I do just want to get into three different ways about how the brain works. And this is 
just a very, very, very quick overview. I could probably do a whole webinar on this, but I'm just going to do super quick. Um, so negative thinking. So when we have negative thoughts, um, that slows the brain coordination down. So when our brain coordination is slowed down, it affects our mood, right? So the more you focus on negative thoughts, the more synapses and neurons your brain will create that create and support negative thought process. So basically, when you think negative thoughts, like, oh my gosh, why do I have this? Poor me, why me? Which is all very normal and acceptable and it's okay to feel that way. But the more you have those negative thinking patterns, your brain is actually creating pathways to continue to think negatively. So if we're going into the positive thinking, um, when you are thinking positive thoughts um, and you're feeling hopeful and happy, the cortisol in our brain actually decreases and our brain produces serotonin. And serotonin is a great thing and it creates more positive thoughts. So by thinking positively, you are actually creating pathways in your brain to think positively. So how powerful is that, right? If you wake up in the morning, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm in so much pain, I'm gonna have an awful day. Guess what? You probably are not gonna have a great day because you are already in a place where you are thinking really negative thoughts. And I get it, I, I understand it, I have been there, but it's not necessarily going to set you up for the best day. So one thing I always tell the patients I work with is, Start that day with a positive thought, right? Start that day with how you want to live that day. And we'll get into that more specifically um, shortly. So remember, negative thoughts lead to negative thinking. Positive thoughts are going to create positive um, pathways and neurons in your brain that fire off um, serotonin, which can actually create positive thinking. So you are actually in control of that more than you think. Um, Anxiety in the brain is really important to talk about, too. So when we get anxious, the brain releases chemicals like cortisol and um, norepinephrine, which causes heart, you know, our heart to beat faster. It causes our blood pressure to increase. So when we get anxious, you know, our body is, goes into this fight or flight mode. So in the next few slides, we're going to talk about specific things that we can do to help bring this anxiety down and to help combat this negative thinking um, with specific coping skills. So one of the coping strategies that I love the most um, in working with my patients is daily journaling. So um, it's at the bottom here on the slide, but I want to dive into that a little bit more deeply. So daily journaling and doing a gratitude journal. So I love to suggest to my patients that you do a journal either in the morning or at night or both, and you write one thing that you're grateful for. So you had a really hard day, work was hard, you couldn't work, you were in too much pain, you brought your child to the doctor, whatever all the tough stuff is, try to find that silver lining. By finding that silver lining, you are thinking a positive thought, you are creating those positive um, pathways in your brain, which can actually make you happier. And write that positive thought down, find that silver lining and journal about it, write about it. Journaling is one of the most cathartic you know, coping skills and coping strategies, and it's easy and it's just really, really powerful. Um, so gratitude journaling is one thing that I always recommend and I really, really think um, can be really important. The other one is mindful meditation. So I think that's on, on the next slide, but I'm going to talk about it here. So mindful meditation can be really, really hard to do, um, but it only takes five minutes. So the way you do it is you would find a place to sit, or if you can't sit, lay down somewhere and kind of just try to relax, not think about what's going to happen, not think about what happened yesterday, but really try to be present in the moment. And close your eyes and let your thoughts just come and go. And, you know, whether it's, you know, I feel pain today, or I had a tough day today, or I had a really good day today, whatever thoughts enter your mind in that moment, let yourself feel that. Let yourself, you know, experience that and recognize that thought and just kind of let it go. So the point of meditation is to be present in the moment, to feel any emotions you're feeling, to hear any thoughts that you're thinking. And this, if you do this for five minutes every day, there um, is actually 
research that shows that it helps you have more control over your emotions because you are learning to recognize your emotions, to feel your emotions, to really understand your body and how we respond to emotions. Um, so you can try my a mindful meditation in it and it might be really, really helpful. Um, so specific ones that are up on this slide is to exercise and eat healthy. I know it's not always easy. If there's pain involved, it might not really be feasible, but even taking a walk outside, um, getting outside for five minutes. If you feel like you can't physically walk a long way, just sitting on your front porch or um, your front steps or whatever, just getting some fresh air is really important. Um, engaging in a pleasant hobby or activity, right? So finding something that you really like to do, whether it's painting or, um, I don't know, crocheting or reading a book or, you know, whatever that hobby might be, find it and do it. So by doing something every day that makes you happy, you are releasing serotonin into your brain to actually create happier moments for yourself and your body recognizes those happy moments and we have muscle memory. So by doing something every day that makes you happy can increase your mood and it can help with any depression you might be feeling. Um, consistent structure and pattern in your life is really, really important. Again, hard to do. I understand that, but also really important. Knowing your limits. You know, your friend asks you to go out, you know, you're in pain, you can't do that hike. So being able to say no or letting them know, maybe I can do, you know, part of it. So knowing your limits so you don't overextend yourself. Um, taking a time out. This is specific to caregivers too, right? Letting the person you're caring for say like, I need 10 minutes to myself right now, or I need, you know, some time away. That's okay to say that. Um, seeking support from coworker, family, and friends. So I know this came up on the poll that a lot of you did do reach out to them. And I think that's wonderful. And if you have a support network with that community is great. Um, I think reaching out to people and letting them know how you feel is really, really important. Um, journaling, we did yoga is really important too. It's a great coping skill. Um, that breathing that comes with yoga can really, really help curb anxiety. So that's um, a really great thing too. Um, distraction. So I love this coping skill. I think it's, it's really wonderful. If you, I'm going to go back to the pain um, example for a little bit. So if we're feeling pain in that moment and we're feeling really, really hurt, um, both emotionally and physically, finding something to distract yourself can be very, very helpful. Um, whether it's having a friend over or playing a game with your child or doing something to kind of get your mind off of that pain. Um, if you focus more on pain, the more pain you're going to feel. So remember that. So if you distract yourself from it, you are actually um, lessening the pain. You might not feel it, but your your brain is is distracting yourself from feeling the pain. Um, music is a great coping skill for a lot of teenagers specifically. Um, relaxation skills, um, diaphragmatic breathing is really important, especially for those of us who are anxious. Um, when we are anxious and our brain releases chemicals that have us go into a fight or flight response, deep breathing actually stops those chemicals from being released. So by if you're in a in a place where you're feeling really anxious and you're panicky, simply by taking a deep breath in, so let's say seven counts in or four counts in, depending on what you're able to do, and then five counts out through your mouth, so in through your nose and out through your mouth is the best way to do diaphragmatic breathing and really fill up your belly. And by doing those types of breaths, you are actually stopping the chemicals being released into your brain that cause us to feel anxious. So that's a great coping skill you can use in the moment when you are feeling anxious um, because it works. It really does. Um, so exercising, obviously, if you are able to do that, um, guided imagery, uh, meditation is really a meditation and mediation um, is great, too, which we had talked about, the mindful meditation, which is very similar to the guided imagery. Um, positive self-statements, which also goes with that daily journal and gratitude journal that I um, had talked about too. So talking positively about yourself and good things about yourself and good things about your day. Um, goal setting is really important as well. So if we have goals that we are working on or goals that we are working towards, 
it tends to give us a more positive outlook on things. So even if it's a small daily goal, like I'm going to get to the grocery store today, even though my lower back is hurting, I'm going to get there. And you know what? When you get to that store and you come home and you are exhausted, you may feel really crummy, but you accomplished your goal. So set goals for yourself because that can be a true sense of accomplishment. Um, and then pleasant activity planning. So planning things that make you happy. Again, doing at least one thing a day that makes you happy is actually going to decrease your depression and increase your mood. So that's also a really, really good thing to do. Um, so that is the end of my coping skills here. And I did put my contact information here with my email. So please, if you have any questions that you don't feel comfortable asking over um, the chat here, please send any questions to this email. If you have any comments, um, you know, please feel free to contact me. Um, I know I there was a lot of material to cover, so I feel like there's a lot of things that I could have gone more in depth on very easily. So if there's stuff that you want me to go more in depth on, you know, just let me know or ask a question um, in the question panel. But that concludes the presentation um, for tonight. So please send any questions if you have them. Perfect. Thank you so much, Adriana. We are now going to begin answering the questions that were submitted during today's presentation. As a quick reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. We will answer as many questions as possible. However, if we aren't able to answer all the questions, we will respond offline. Over to you, Deb. Awesome, thank you. So we did get a couple questions during the course of the um, webinar. Um, Adriana, one of the questions that we got was, um, how important is it to find a therapist who has experience with a chronic illness? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, does any therapist do, is, are there any certain qualifications or questions that maybe we should ask when trying to find a therapist with the appropriate experience? Yes, yeah, so that, that's a great question. So um, I don't think you need to find a therapist specific to someone or specific to um, someone that might be knowledgeable about, you know, chronic rare disease or living um, with hypophosphatasia or a chronic um, pain disorder, but it can be helpful. So there's no specific like licensure or, um, you know, credentials that can put you in a category to just treat those type of patients. But like I've gone to several seminars and, um, about how to treat patients with chronic pain. So I think if, if you are, if you have a lot of pain and you want to go to a therapist that might understand that, I think it can be helpful. But many therapists will advertise if they're familiar with depression, anxiety, um, you know, whatever you feel you might have. So I think it's safe to go with a therapist just for that specific diagnosis. And then if they have experience working with patients um, who have chronic pain or live with a chronic rare disorder, and it's definitely a plus, but I think any therapist who can, you know, treat depression, treat anxiety, um, will be able will be able to help you. Because um, there, there's really no specific credentialing; it might just be like a knowledge of. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. That's great. A couple, we had that question a couple times, so thank you for covering that. Um, we have another question um, that kind of uh, there's. I'm going to combine a couple questions that we got. One is, what's a good way to battle or deal with fatigue? And we had yeah. another question that was, you know, how do you differentiate between pain that may be caused by mental, you know, mental health and depression versus physical pain caused by disease? I think that's a really great question for caregivers and for Absolutely. patients. You know, how do you know Absolutely. when you're dealing with one or the other? Yeah, so the first question was about fatigue, right? How to combat that? Is that yes. the first one? Okay, so I think with fatigue, it's, I mean, to be tired and have to go to a job and, you know, handle children and live a life can be really, really exhausting. So one thing, um, you know, I'm thinking of specific people that I work with who have that as a symptom. And one of the biggest things to do is, and this can be really hard, is to ask for help. So if you're exhausted, 
you know, when you come home from work and you have, I don't know, your this person specific situation, but ask for help from family members, from a neighbor and, and know that it's okay to ask for help. And it doesn't mean that, you know, you can't do it all because we can't do it all, you know, so making sure that you have someone there to help you. Um, there are certain foods that can actually increase um, fatigue, um, which, you know, gluten can slow us down. Sugar can increase our level of tiredness. So, um, you know, if this person can certainly email me directly and I can send them a list of foods that can that can actually cause us to feel more tired and more sluggish, um, that may be, you know, something helpful. And to rest, like, I don't know, you know, if you have a husband or you have somebody at home and, and, and let them know you need a nap and don't feel selfish about it. That self-care is so important. And especially when you're dealing with living with hypophosphatasia, that self-care is even more important because you need to make sure that you're taking care of yourself physically and emotionally. So I would say get help from people um, eating the right foods at work, maybe asking for accommodations if, if you're somebody that works. Um, but you can certainly email me and I am happy to answer that more in depth as well. Um, and the, the second question about, um, pain from a physical, you know, chronic or hypophosphatasia, we'll just say versus pain from an emotional disorder. So typically pain that is caused by anxiety and depression are felt in specific parts of our body. So we get tension headaches. We might feel stiffness in our neck or tightness in our chest, or we might get a lot of stomach aches. So those are the main sources. So headaches, tension headaches, um, tension in our neck, tension in our shoulders, issues with stomach. So those are the five places that you might feel it the most. Um, and the way that you might recognize that it's specific to um, anxiety or depression versus pain is if you have a headache because you're stressed out and you take some deep breaths and the next day it goes away and you're not stressed out anymore, then maybe you can pinpoint it to that. Um, if you're someone that does get anxious and you tense your muscles up a lot, you might feel that mostly in your neck and your um, like shoulder area. So those are typically the places that you would feel that pain from, um, from stress and, and anxiety or, or depression. Um, the physical pain from, you know, specifically hypophosphatasia would, you know, might feel different than that. You might have like, like muscle aches in your legs or in your feet, um, joint pain. Joint pain is not typical of um, a depression or anxiety diagnosis. Again, that pain is more specific to head, neck, and stomach. Okay, great. Um, one of the questions that came in while you were talking about some of the foods with fatigue is, you know, is there a kind of a list of foods that maybe people should avoid or should try to eat more of. So maybe that's something we could follow up with as well, unless you have it at the ready. Yep. So absolutely. I can, I can certainly send out a list. I have, um, you know, just some off the top of my head, you know, gluten, right, is in so many foods. And, and I hate to say go gluten free, but gluten is an inflammatory food. So by yep. eating gluten, you're actually causing inflammation in your body, which can actually cause more pain. So, and Pain can cause tiredness. Inflammation can cause tiredness. So gluten in and of itself is actually a great food to avoid. Um, make sure you're doing it, you know, appropriately. Um, certainly um, any, excuse me, um, sugars can really, really um, impact mood and sugars can really impact um, processed food, right? All processed foods really aren't that great for you. So typically, I mean, it's lean meats, veggies, Fruits that aren't high in carbs are really good um, for curbing fatigue, but I am happy to put together a list and send that out too to get more in depth with that for sure. That's awesome. Great. Um, another question that came in, um, how do we deal with, you know, we know we can't do it all, but the guilt that we, that we feel when we, you know, you feel like you're being lazy, but you just can't do it. You know, it's that, it's that guilt that comes with, you know, having that drive and knowing that you should be doing it, but you really just, you can't deal with it physically. I think a lot of Absolutely. people in our, in our HPP, you know, soft bones group deal with this, especially those who, you know, there's, uh, you know, my son, for example, he's an athlete, he's an athlete in his head, you know, and so he's driven, he's competitive. So how do you, you, you just cope with those kinds of things that you just can't do at all? 
So I think, you know, we want to do it all, right? And especially as, as the, the children too, and as parents, you know, we want to be able to do it all, be that athlete and do everything. And I think there's a part, and this, this is more challenging for the teenagers and the children, but there's a level of acceptance that we have to come to, right? So changing our perspective of what is feeling accomplished. So it might be, you know, I want to be this athlete. I want to, you know, play lacrosse. I want to do all this stuff, or I want to go to this job and come home and take care of my kids and be able to go out with my girlfriends at night. And that's great. But accepting that, that it might be a little bit different and kind of creating a new norm for yourself and a new set of goals for yourself. So I think that's where the, the goal setting comes in, Deb, is being able to identify things that you can do that you will feel good about that you know you can do. So it's accepting your limits, understanding your limits, and setting new goals that you feel good about that allow for you to reach the goals that you have set that you know that are appropriate for you. And I will tell you as a parent, you know, just trying to keep it all together. And, you know, personally, I work two jobs, you know, I come home, I take care of two kids. And it's like, I can't do it all. And the minute I said out loud, I can't do this all, and I admitted it out loud, there was this sense of guilt because it's like, oh my gosh, I should be able to do it all. But there was also a sense of relief to be able to say out loud, you know what, Adriana, you can't do it all. You need help from your in-laws. You need help from your husband. You need help from people. And the second I realized and accepted the fact that it's okay to not be able to do it all, it was amazing. And now it's like, you want to do this for me? Go for it. You, are, you know, it kind of changes your perspective. So I think if that's something that this specific person is really struggling with, cognitive behavioral therapy is awesome. So it's changing the way we think about things and changing the way, you know, that we set goals for ourselves. Um, so that might be really helpful for that specific um, person that asked the question. No, that's great. And I, I you know, want to, I know we're coming up on the um, the end of the, the recording and the, the end of the webinar session. So, you know, I wanted to just share a, a thought that one of the, the participants posted. It's more of a comment than a question that yeah. um, I'm going to read it directly. HPP is a great teacher, motivator, inspiration. I do not identify with being a patient. I see a doctor 15 minutes each month for the rest, for the rest of time. I'm a wife, a friend, a daughter. Let's share some of the positive assets of living and thriving with a fatal condition. I just thought that was, you know, you talked about mindset and, and the power of positivity, and I just thought that that was so, um, you know, reinforcing that kind of mental approach to having HPP. Absolutely, and I think that not being defined by your diagnosis is so important. So understanding that you are somebody else outside of this diagnosis. And I think that's really, really important for people that are struggling specifically with some of the emotional, like significant emotional effects, um, to understand that you're something outside of that. And that's really powerful. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, that concludes our webinar for tonight. So I want to thank you, Adriana, for, for your time your, and sharing your expertise and your talents with our HPT community. And thank all of you who have attended um, throughout the, the hour-long webcast. Um, you know, we're so fortunate to have you as part of our community. And I didn't mention it earlier on, but we're super fortunate to have you as a region lead in the Northeast. So anybody who's in the Northeast, you know, if you go to a meeting, Adriana will likely be there and you can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with her and really Absolutely. tap into more knowledge and wealth. And so we really appreciate that. You won't be disappointed for sure. Um, and I you. just want to mention this webinar was recorded and it's going to be posted to our SoftBones YouTube channel. Um, if you don't know where that is, you can find it on our website, but it will be there in the upcoming days. And um, I actually look forward to sharing it with friends and family. I think it goes beyond hypophosphatasia and many of the things that you spoke about. Um, for everybody on the phone, we look forward to your feedback and to bringing you more webinars in the future. So have a great night and be well, everyone. Great. great. Thank you for joining. And thank you, Adriana and Deb. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar, The Emotional Effects of Living with a Chronic Rare Disease. On behalf of SoftBones and our presenters, Thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.